When I was a kid, there was a, a phrase that my parents would whip out whenever I was being a picky eater. They'd say, e Joe, you know, there are starving children in China. Which meant either, you know, you should be grateful to get this food because there's some people out there who don't get it, or something more like, you know, this is food that could be going to a starving kid, and if you don't eat it, you're literally taking food out of a starving child's mouth. You're killing some kid in China if you don't eat this. Yeah, in my house, every entree was served with a side order of shame. Shame. How do you like your shame, Master or Algratin? But this wasn't just my house, this was everywhere. This was the thing that parents would say to kids when they wouldn't eat. There are starving kids in China. So my impression of China when I was a kid was that it was just like this destitute wasteland just littered with starving children. I imagine them like sitting at a dilapidated table slicing up a single bean like that, that, that Disney cartoon. It was only much later that I found out that there was no major food shortage in China. They were fine. So what was that about? Turns out, it's because when my parents were kids, there very much were starving kids in China. Yeah, have you ever actually looked into the Great Chinese Famine? Because... Holy crap, dude. It's estimated up to 55 million people died from starvation between the years 1959 and 1961. Yeah, that's three quarters the number of people who died worldwide in World War II. In one country. In three years. Yeah, try to guess where it happened on this graph. Do you see it? It's pretty subtle. But this story isn't about the Great Chinese Famine. It is about one of the people who was responsible for it. A scientist whose backwards ideas about plants also helped create the Soviet Famine, the Kazakh Famine, and the Holomador in Ukraine. And a guy who, incredibly, is gaining in popularity in some places. <laughs> In 1924, after a series of strokes, the founder of the Soviet Union, Vladimir Lenin, died. And in his wake, Joseph Stalin stepped in to lead the country. And of course, by stepped in, I mean he destroyed the old leadership by charging them with bogus crimes, systematically arresting and executing them. Stalin. He became known as the Great Purge, which uh, any event in history that's described as a purge is generally not a good time. But Stalin had big ideas to reshape the Soviet Union, based on his own nationalistic brand of Marxism that he called socialism in one country. Yeah, basically Lenin was more concerned with spreading communism around the world, but Stalin just wanted to focus on strengthening the Soviet Union. Yeah, at this point the uh, Industrial Revolution had been going on for decades, but Russia had really fallen behind Europe and the rest of the world in that regard, um, especially around agriculture. So Stalin began a series of five-year plans to help industrialize the country. Um, he was basically worried that if the Soviet Union didn't modernize, then communism would fail, and then that would allow its capitalist neighbors to destroy the country. Which, by the way, this whole five-year plan thing that he started basically continued until the end of the Soviet Union uh, up in, in the 90s. Um, they weren't all five years, some were four, the longest was seven. Uh, but yeah, by the time the Soviet Union fell, they were in the middle of their 12th plan. So that's something you know. So, in many ways, this actually worked. They saw massive economic growth in coal, oil, and steel productivity, but it was brutal. Yeah, factories were given these insane goals that were almost impossible to meet. And the punishment, if you failed to meet that goal, you didn't just get fired, you were branded an enemy of the state, and imprisoned, or even executed. So look, layoffs are bad, but that's worse. And then he wanted to collectivize the farms, and that was another big part of his five-year plan. He thought that, you know, if the country was going to industrialize, he would have a lot of mouths to feed, so he wanted to increase the agricultural productivity, and he thought the best way to do that was to, you know, basically turn all the individually owned farms under the authority of the state. And there was this one specific group of especially wealthier farmers called Kulaks that he focused most of his ire on. About five million of them were deported, or just, you know, disappeared. So yeah, like imagine you've been running a farm for generations, growing and selling your crops, and then the Soviet army comes in all... <laughs> I like that. I'm gonna steal it. That's mine now. Uh, but yeah, because of that, I think, understandably, there was a lot of resistance from farmers. Some farmers went to the extent of actually killing all their animals and destroying their crops rather than let the state have them. So that itself caused disruptions in the food supply, but far worse than that was that when the state took over these farms, they changed how they ran them. So again, they wanted to increase productivity, and to do that, you've got to do things differently. And Stalin had just the guy in mind to find this new way. Stalin had become impressed by the ideas of a prominent scientist named Trofim Lysenko, a man whose policies would lead to waves of famines across multiple countries. Lysenko was born in Ukraine to a peasant family in 1898. He only learned to read and write at age 13. He graduated from the Uman School of Horticulture in 1921 and the Kiev Agricultural Institute in 1925. 
There he worked on plant breeding experiments at an agricultural station. His first published papers appeared in 1923. Um, he didn't know any foreign languages and he had to learn everything through translations. Now, anywhere else in the world, this might have been an issue, you know, that he had limited access to international science developments. But in the Soviet Union, at that time anyway, that was considered a plus. They wanted to promote homegrown scientists, and the more underprivileged their upbringing, the better. Because, you know, they were all about the working class. But it was an article published in Pravda, the Communist Party's official newspaper in 1927, that launched his career. The article covered a paper that he had published that year that proposed a new way of increasing plant productivity called vernalization. Vernalization is when you artificially expose plants or seeds to temperatures that are colder than normal to help stimulate flowering or maybe increase seed production. For example, he claimed in his paper that he took winter wheat seeds and exposed them to cold temperatures, which made them more productive in the spring. But his research was deeply flawed. It wasn't done with proper controls or run through statistical analysis. And it's not like people didn't know about this method. Farmers have been using it since the 19th century. And botanists have been studying this for at least 10 years before Lysenko, so he wasn't really breaking new ground or anything like that. But the Soviet leadership liked his beliefs. And they especially liked that he was a hardcore communist who hated the West. So Stalin appointed him the director of the Institute of Genetics of the Academy of Sciences in the USSR and the president of the VI Lenin All-Union Academy of Agricultural Sciences. Yeah, so he was like the guy. And as the guy, he wielded his power like a good authoritarian, and he made an enemy out of anybody who questioned his research. And of course, what happens to enemies of the state in Stalin's Soviet Union? They were imprisoned or executed. His biggest critic was an agronomist and a geneticist named Nikolai Vavilov, who ended up dying of starvation in prison. Okay, so let's, let's step back for a second. What were these beliefs exactly? What was it that the Soviet leadership had hung their hat on with this guy? First of all, he rejected the science of genetics, specifically as developed by Gregor Mendel and Thomas Hunt Morgan. Yeah, probably not great when the director of the Institute of Genetics didn't believe in genetics. He thought this brand of science was idealistic and practical and a product of bourgeois capitalism. Like Andrew Carnegie decided how genes should be passed or something. Lysenko instead followed the work of a Russian naturalist named Ivan V. Mishurin, who in turn believed in a neo-Lamarckian form of evolution. Lamarckianism is named after a French naturalist, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, who theorized in 1809 that physical changes to organisms during their lifetime can be transmitted to their offspring. Yeah, this was the early days of evolution. Like, they, they knew that species changed over time, but they weren't quite sure why. Um, and this was one of the ways that they tried to explain it. Like, they would argue that giraffes grew long necks because they would stretch their necks trying to reach the highest leaves. Um, and because they stretched their necks so much, their offsprings were then born with longer necks. Basically, Lysenko believed that it was the environment alone that shapes animals and plants. So, you know, by putting them in a proper setting and exposing them to the right stimuli, you can change them any way you want. So, as head of Soviet agriculture, he set out to educate Soviet crops to spout at different times of the year. This is why he did things like soaking them in freezing water. He said that future generations of crops would remember these environmental cues and then inherit beneficial traits. The thing about that, though, is that um, it's impossible. As Sam Keane wrote in The Atlantic in 2017, quote, it's akin to cutting the tail off a cat and then expecting her to give birth to tailless kittens. Okay, so just so that we're all on the same page concerning genetics, here's how genetics actually works. All plants and animals have genes that determine traits passed on to their offspring. For example, humans have around 25,000 to 35,000 genes, and each gene has a special job that the DNA in it tells it to do inside a cell. Genes also come in pairs. Each parent has two copies of each of their genes, but each parent only passes along just one copy of their genes to their offspring. This makes up the genes that you have and helps determine things like your hair or eye color or how tall or short you'll be. But Lysenko didn't believe in genes. He promised that his methods would boost crop yields nationwide through massive farms with crops planted extremely close together. And he said that they wouldn't compete against each other because they were of the same species, or class. He thought the amount of milk that a cow produces would determine on how well the cow was treated and not by its genetics. Oh, and he also claimed that cuckoo birds were created by feeding birds hairy caterpillars. That, that kind of thing. See, that was the thing that everybody liked about him. His theories echoed the language and ideology of communism. You know, like, like growing plants together was the same as class solidarity, or getting cows to produce more milk because they were treated well was similar to treating workers better. And because they were so obsessed with proving that communism was superior, even the natural order of things, Stalin implemented these ideas throughout all of Soviet agriculture. And the result? <laughs> Almost everything grown under these methods died or rotted. So yeah, you know, he told farmers that planting each generation of seeds closer and closer together would just get them used to the reduction in growing room, and then more could be grown in smaller plots of land. 
What this actually did is it caused crops to compete for nutrients and root space, and the result was stunted growth. And they also told farmers to dig really deep into the soil, up to two meters compared to the you know, 10 or 20 centimeters that they previously would do. And the reason given for this was that it would bring up more fertile soil, but um, actually the, the most fertile soil is the topsoil up on top, so the crops suffered. So sure, Stalin is to blame for the famines that killed at least 7 million people, but it was Lysenko's ideas that prolonged the famines. Death from the famines peaked from 1932 to 1933. Four years later, there was a 163-fold increase in farmland using Lysenko's methods, and food production was even lower than before. During the early 30s, between Russia, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan, around 15 million people died. But then in the late 1950s, China faced its own catch-up moment where they wanted to get as industrialized as the rest of the world. So they used many of the same policies that Stalin did, because again, they were actually kind of successful economically. Unfortunately, this included Lysenko's ideas. And this is kind of where I started this video. Estimates of the Great Chinese Famine go as high as 55 million people with at least 30 million people on the low end, which even that would double what the USSR went through. And it, it's easy to hear a number like that and just kind of tune out, but some of the stories that came out of China during that time were just horrendous. Some peasants resorted to eating tree bark, bird droppings, and each other. Cannibalism ran rampant which is why my parents' generation all those years later were still talking about starving children in China. It was that bad, dude. Stalin died in 1953, and their new leader, Nikita Khrushchev, supported Lysenko. At first. But other Soviet scientists emerged and started to debunk Lysenko's claims, and they brought to light how he used his political influence to denounce anybody who criticized him. Nobel Peace Prize recipient and physicist Andrei Sakharov spoke to the General Assembly of the Russian Academy of Sciences in 1964, and countered Lysenko's ideas, at one point saying, quote, He is responsible for the shameful backwardness of Soviet biology and genetics in particular, for the dissemination of pseudoscientific views, for adventurism, for the degradation of learning, and for the defamation, firing, arrest, even death, of many genuine scientists. This was the beginning of the end for Lysenko. After this speech, the media started to spread anti-Lysenko articles that caused him to be disgraced. He was removed from his directorship in 1965, and he died in 1976. And yet, he's gaining in popularity again. There has been a recent trend in Russian science of kind of rethinking his role in the famines. According to the book Lysenko's Ghost by Lauren Graham, Lysenko's rehabilitation is due to a few things. First of all, sympathies to Stalin, the growing influence of the Russian Orthodox Church, and the rise in popularity of modern epigenetics. So yeah, as I mentioned earlier, we have thousands of genes, uh, but not all of them are active at once. Some of these genes get turned on or off inside of cells, and the study of these changes is called epigenetics. One thing that turns genes on or off are environmental cues. And these environmentally driven changes can, yes, pass from a parent to its offspring. In other words, the way you live your life, the choices you make, can actually affect the genes that you pass on to your kids. That sounds exactly like what Lysenko was saying. And to some people, this is validation of his ideas. But if you look at his work, it shows that he didn't predict epigenetics in any important way. In fact, he claimed that genes didn't exist, and the whole basis of epigenetics is that they do. Plus, epigenetic changes that tend to pass from parent to offspring do disappear after a few generations. They're not permanent, which is the opposite of what Lysenko believed. But the main reason that Lysenko's ideas are becoming popular again is because Lysenko was extremely anti-West. And, uh... Russia's in a bit of an anti-West phase right now. Since science is kind of a bedrock of Western culture, Lysenko is presented as a hero uh, to the Russians because he stood up to Western science. Which, I mean, I get that, but um, I don't know. Is, isn't there somebody else you can look up to who didn't contribute to, you know, mass cannibalism? Now, to be fair to Lysenko, he did not personally kill 70 million people, and the famines that did weren't all his fault. There were mountains of bad ideas and mismanagement that led to those disasters. His were just some of them. But is it fair to call him the worst scientist of all time? I mean, in terms of body count, maybe you'd be hard pressed to find somebody whose ideas have killed more people. But in terms of just, you know, bad at the job of being a scientist? Yes, definitely. He started with a conclusion and then changed the facts to fit what he wanted to be true. And then he suppressed the peer review process. That's, that's like how science works. He, he stopped science from working. And he based his science on his political beliefs. I mean, he said that genetics was too capitalist. What, what does that even mean? Yeah, old Trofim and all his study never fully understood the fundamentals of science. 
If only he'd had Brilliant back then, how many millions of lives could have been saved? All you'd have to do is click the Science Path and Brilliant, and the very first course is on scientific thinking. They start you with the basics, how you form a hypothesis, how you test it, doing things in a way that keeps it objective, peer review. They start by helping you think like a scientist, and then once that's set up, you can move on to physics of the everyday, chemical reactions, and probabilities. Next thing you know, you're figuring out how orbital dynamics works. It's kind of like that scene in Batman Forever when Jim Carrey was just like piping in information from all over the city, just absorbing knowledge like a supervillain. Yeah, Brilliant's just like that. Actually, that's, that's way too passive because Brilliant is actually quite interactive. It uses problem solving and puzzles and games to help you just kind of figure it out in a way that makes sense to you. And, and that's what really sticks. Uh, it's like playing a game that helps keep you sharp. And of course, there's an app. So, you know, whenever you're bored, instead of playing some mindless game, you can, you can get a little bit sharper. It's a brain sharpener. They also have some specific courses that they made in collaboration with YouTube channels that you probably follow. Anyway, Brilliant's great, and if you want to check it out, you can get 30 days for free when you go to brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. If you decide it's not your thing, no harm, no foul, but if you decide to stay, you'll get 20% off your annual membership. Just for watching this video. Did you think when you clicked on this video that you would get an exclusive offer just for doing so? Well, it's happening, and you know what? You deserve it. Anyway, the link's down below, brilliant.org slash answers with Joe, 20% off your annual membership. Go check it out. All right, thanks for watching. Big thanks to the Answer Files on Patreon and the channel members who are helping to keep the lights on around here, forming an awesome community, just being really cool people. I want to shout out some Patreon people real quick. We've got Phoebe, Danny Wool, Sean McKinney, uh, Juan and Zola, Dylan Weems, and Chris Anderson. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get early access to videos, get access to exclusive live streams and all kinds of other fun perks, uh, just go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. All right, please like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check out this video because Google thinks you'll like that one or any of the videos on the side. If you're on your web browser that have my little face and the thumbnail and whatnot, uh, give them a look. If you like them, I invite you to subscribe. Come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye opening rest of the week, stay safe. And I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.